be about the fourth that we are having. And we're incredibly excited to be having this conversation on this all important subject or issue on decolonization of education in Africa, why Pan-Africanism uh, can break the genes. And this is also a call from a, a, a publication uh, written by one of my colleagues here, James Koji, did a very interesting work on, on this particular subject. So from that, we want to have a conversation and we're happy that you are all able to join us. And we could not have had a better panel uh, than this. Of course, I admit that we were failed in uh, making, uh, especially given that I'm coming to you from the Office of the Gender Advocacy Working Group to have a, a woman representation on this. Uh, we'll do better the next time. We tried, we we're just unsuccessful this time around. Uh, but other than that, this obviously is a panel that we have every confidence in and trust that they will lead us to have a very interesting conversation. My name is Abdul Karim Ibrahim, and obviously I'm the moderator for today's discussion. And joining us for this all important conversation, uh, in no particular order, I'll introduce my guests once again for the benefit of those who are just uh, joining us. Uh, Dr. Savo Heleta is a researcher and educator with more than 10 years experience uh, in higher education, academic research, curriculum development, teaching, research publishing, and internationalization in South Africa. Uh, his research interests also are uh, border on issues of decolonization of knowledge, obviously makes him a very qualified person for this conversation, higher education, internationalization, conflict analysis, and conflict transformation, post-war reconstruction, and peace building, higher education in post-war settings, sustainable development, xenophobia, and social justice advocacy and activism. And he himself, a survivor of the Bosnian war, uh, he's also the author of Not My Turn to Die, Memoirs of a Broken Childhood in Bosnia. And Professor Sabu also works as an internationalization uh, specialist in the Department of International Education and Partnerships at the Durban University of Technology, South Africa. And uh, we also have joining us Mr. Sakile Fire. Uh, Mr. Sakile Fire is a lecturer and program leader of the undergraduate degree program in development studies at Nelson Mandela University in South Africa. Uh, Cabrera, I see. I hope I have not uh, butchered uh, the name. But his main interests or uh, areas of teaching are around development, decolonization, and emerging market economies. Uh, he also supervises honors and master students in the broad fields of youth entrepreneurship, youth unemployment and employability, among other uh, issues of such uh, nature. And he's also currently uh, focusing, uh, he's very busy, obviously, on his PhD on graduate employability. Also joined again by Mr. Alexis Mayaka Bosire. Uh, Mr. Bosire is a Kenyan educationist uh, who serves as the Global Secretary for Education and Disability and Acting Global Secretary for Sports at the United Pan-Africanist Movement, UPAM. Uh, he is also the Director at Kenya Sign Language Online uh, classes in which he has offered free introductory sign language training to about 10,000 uh, students uh, drawn from various professionals and professions in the past three years. And he's also uh, who's uh, a Bachelor of Education degree from the University of Nairobi and a Master's in Business Administration uh, from uh, Kisi University. He's also trained in special and inclusive education and digital teaching for educators from Israel. He's a man of so many other things. And on this note, I want to welcome all of you and to thank you so much uh, for joining us this morning uh, for this very important discussion. I left Professor um, Yosef Wadid out uh, because he's still unable to connect with us. I would have loved to do the introduction while he is here, but let me just do that very quickly, even as he's not uh, been able to join us now. Professor uh, Yosef Wadid holds a doctorate in education, policy, and philosophy from the University of Western Cape and Stellenbosch Universities uh, in South Africa, respectively, and is among Africa's leading philosophers of education today. And as a distinguished professor at Stellenbosch University, he has been a prolific author with some 379 publications to his name. Quite clearly, a man 
uh, of so many things. From 2020 to 2021, he collaborated with renowned international scholars on a leading UNESCO pioneered research project, Education for Flourishing and Flourishing in Education, initiated by the Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Education for Peace and Sustainable Development. His advancement of higher education in Africa is also acknowledged by the Council of Higher Education in South Africa, of which he has been a board member since 2019. So I cannot belabor uh, the, the expertise and the qualification of our panelists. Once again, to all of you, thank you very much for joining us this morning. So I want to then, at this point, very quickly uh, get into our conversation. And uh, I start with you, Dr. Savo Heleta. Um, there's this piece that I, I found from the works of the Ghanaian um, uh, philosopher, uh, Professor Kwesi Redu, and in, in the discussion on issues of uh, decolonization, he makes a very profound point that I want to share with you and to make that the basis uh, for the conversation or to at least uh, begin the conversation uh, for all of us. And here's what uh, Professor Kwesi Redu uh, says in his work again uh, on African philosophy. And he says that it is very important that Africans have a philosophy of their own. And in particular, just to quote, he says that, so divest African philosophical thinking of all undue influences is a very important thing. And he goes ahead to also explain in his own terms what he considers to be decolonization. And that would be to completely rid ourselves of the colonial element and all the things that, that continue to pervade uh, the African setup. And based on that, I would ask you, uh, Dr. Savo Heleta, what your own understanding of decolonization is, and to what extent is it very important, especially in the area of education? Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for, for inviting me to, to, to this event. Um, decolonization of knowledge. I, I mean, when we talk about decolonization, we can, we can talk about uh, political decolonization, um, economic decolonization, we can also, talk what we're talking about today, um, you know, when it comes to specifically knowledge. And uh, when you talk about knowledge on the African continent, all, all knowledge in the global south, in the, in the formerly colonized countries, uh, we have to talk about the, the way that knowledge has been used and abused since the colonial conquest to oppress and subjugate people. And, you know, we, we get to, we get, we, we are currently, we, in the 21st century, um, we have decades of, of independence in many African countries. We have um, a bit less time of, of, of South African independence and freedom, you know, freedom from, a, from apartheid, colonialism and apartheid, uh, but we're still talking about decolonization. Um, and, you know, very, something that is very important to highlight specifically in South Africa, you know, we're talking about decolonization because, not because, not because the post-apartheid system wanted to, to make fundamental changes. Um, it's only because in 2016, young black South African students said we have had enough with white curriculum, we have had enough with white domination in higher education, we have had enough with you know, being fed these um, irrelevant Western ideas and knowledges to and and, and 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 at the same time seeing that the rest of the world including the African continent and the ideas philosophies uh, theories you know experiences from the African continent and the global south are completely absent in our curriculum and that's why we we have had discussions and debates in South Africa since then we, we wouldn't be talking about it um, definitely it would never become so prominent if it wasn't for the young black South African students saying we've had enough um, and I'm glad that, you know, you are asking us to also talk about this. Um, but so, so what is decolonization? It is, it is, it is uh, in my writing, I talk about dismantling the Eurocentric hegemony in knowledge. 
Um, the, the hegemony that's been part and parcel of uh, subjugation, exploitation, conquest um, went ahead, went together with uh, colonialism, with genocides, uh, with slavery, with new colonialism, and continues up until today. Um, and you know, it is it is it is clear and evident the way it is expressed in South Africa, but it's also clear and evident the way it's expressed across the global South, across various African countries. And I know Sakile Piri, uh, one of the panelists, uh, he's going to talk about how coloniality is expressed in other African countries. You know, in South Africa, we talk about, you know, the, 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 the domination of South African academia by uh, white academics, many, who, many of whom coming from the old apartheid system. And that is a fact, but in many, African countries uh, where white academics are not present, you, curriculum is still Eurocentric. And we need to talk about these problems. We need to talk about coloniality and, and how is it still being maintained across the world? Um, and, and we need to talk about global uh, power dynamics in knowledge and knowledge production and, and the way that you know, African academia is is, 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 is suffering in this space to, to, to emerge and, you know, way, you know, the, 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 the least amount of collaboration on the African continent when it comes to higher education and research is between African countries and African academics. Um, and we need to unpack and hopefully we'll have a moment to talk about that in, in this webinar. But decolonization is about dismantling this Eurocentric hegemony that's been part and, part and parcel of subjugation over centuries and still continues in, in different forms and different ways through curriculum, through the way uh, that we, you know, give preference to some forms of knowledge while we subjugate other forms of knowledge. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and I, I like the point that you make, especially in respect of what young South Africans, for instance, have done. That also means that uh, even as we continue with this conversation, it's important to recognize that the, the issue of decolonization is not one that will be handed to, to Africans per se. It is one that we must also demand, and that requires a certain consciousness that I would love for us to come back and delve more uh, into. But, but for now, uh, let me just also welcome uh, uh, Professor Yusuf uh, Wagi. Uh, Prof, uh, thank you very much for, for joining us. I'm going to come to you, but let me go to Mr. Alexis uh, Mayaka uh, from Kenya. And to also get a sense of what decolonization is, if if you are you are Kenyan, what what practical experiences or realities can help one who may not fully understand this to appreciate what exactly it is that we are talking about here, Mr. Alexis? Uh, you're, you're you're muted still, so you can unmute yourself and then yes. Oh, thank, thank you very much. Great. So thank you very much for this opportunity, Mr. Abdul. And uh, I want to thank uh, my panel, uh, fellow panelists for, and also the uh, attendees for you know, inviting me into this and uh, I'm really privileged. So when we talk about decolonization, of course, we understand that uh, about 57 years ago, Africa got independence, of course, uh, except Ethiopia. And, um, Decolonization, I mean, the system of education that came with us is the system of education which the colonists came with. And it's the system of education that really was favoring them, that was producing the kind of labor force that was suited for them. And um, if you look at the kind of problems that Africa is facing, this kind of system of education is not solving those problems. Of course, we're talking of problems like hunger. We're talking of problems like, uh, you know, um, irrigation, we're talking of famine, we're talking of, uh, uh, you know, diseases. But when we look at the kind of courses that we are studying, of course, we're studying some courses. I'm not saying that they are not useful, but we are saying that they are less useful. There are courses we're doing, of course, uh, we're talking of, uh, you know, sociology. I mean, there is a, a great, um, there's a great uh, scholar from uh, Nigeria, and he's really talked about, uh, you know, the system of education which was brought in Africa just to promote the system of remembrance. And uh, I, I will, uh, in a short while, request you to play for me that clip. I, I shared a link, but before that, so the mind of an African, I mean, the mind of uh, uh, a, a student in Africa, right from high school you know, to the university, 
It's basically to remember stuff. And uh, at the end of it all, does not promote thinking. And uh, this is really uh, not solving the problems which we have. The problems which we have, number one, which is irrigation, needs some kind of education, some kind of system of education, curriculum, which will produce graduates, which in their society can be able to look at the problems which are there and be able to solve them. I actually um, appreciate one young guy uh, by the name Osman Tore, who you know looked around where he came from, from the Gambia, and uh, he was given a scholarship to go and study in the Canada, but instead he, he decided to go to Rwanda to do his master's there because he wanted to understand the, system, the society we are from, the kind of problems that we are facing, and how can we solve them? So um, let me stop there, but I, I will make uh, my presentation my presentation later on. Thank you very much. Very well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Basire. And uh, I want to bring in um, uh, Mr. Sakile Fire here, uh, because especially with the reference that Dr. Uh, Heleta uh, made to young South Africans and a kind of consciousness or, or, or realization that exists there. I want you to also take me through what it tastes like generally uh, in South Africa, and particularly in the education space. More recently, we saw um, campaigns like uh, Roads Must Fall uh, and other efforts to decolonize institutions of higher learning in South Africa and all of that. But then many of us, especially in South uh, um, Western Africa, this is not a conversation that we often have. And so help us really, in your own understanding, drawing on your experiences as South African, tell us what it tastes like in, in South Africa when we talk about colonization and issues of decolonization, sir. Uh, you're also muted, so if you can. <laughs> Two years of uh, online learning and I still forget to unmute the mic. Um, thank you very much, Abdul. Thank you, James, and thank you to ASSU for inviting us. Um, just a disclaimer, I'm actually from Zambia. Um, so I can't claim to speak on, on behalf of uh, the Black South African experience, but even as a non-South African Black person working in higher education in South Africa, um, there's a certain violence in the spaces and even in the physical spaces in which you exist where you see statues of um, colonizers or uh, people who are part of the system of white settler colonialism in South Africa. Um, I mean, I, I'm at, uh, I work at Nelson Mandela University, which previously was NMMU, which previously was UBE, which was a proud supporter of the VUD and the apartheid regime. And that is a legacy of South African higher education that we can't run away from. It's also a legacy, which as alluded to by uh, Dr. Hereta, that a lot of students are saying, we have to challenge this. And not only is there a certain violence in the curriculum, but even in the physical spaces in which we exist, there is a certain violence that comes with that. And we're not gonna accept this anymore. And I think that that was a jumping point for, um, or a starting point for a lot of the Feasmus Falls. It, it really challenged things we were saying, even with regard to Pan-Africanism. Um, I remember in the first Feasmus Falls protests, our student unions were saying, a lot of South African higher education institutions came to be African universities, but the way you treat Africans, um, non-South African Africans coming here, why do you charge them significantly high fees? Why do you insist that they pay a year in advance? And they're, you claiming to be Pan-African or welcoming other African students seems to be in writing or in name only, but the way in which you treat our brothers and sisters from the continent is, is, is not representative of the values according to uh, the university's uh, ethos or the Ubuntu that we seem to say we hold on to. So um, there's a questioning, there's a challenging, which is what education should do, but there's also a holding to account um, the educators, the re uh, university leaders um, of the, our various institutions and yeah, I think that maybe I'll speak about it later, but yeah. you know, being from Zambia and even working in South Africa, you have questions about um, why are we still talking about decolonization? You know, Zambia gained independence in 1964. Yeah. 
before, you know, and, uh, you know, we're not talking about the end of colonialism whereby um, political sovereignty was given back to Africans. We're talking about coloniality um, and maybe I will, I will, I don't know if I have time to share a quote on coloni colon coloniality now. Abdul, can I go ahead? Oh, please go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So um, I'm going to share a quote from one of my favorite authors. His name is Nelson Maldonado Torres. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. But uh, I mean, in speaking on coloniality versus colonialism, he says, uh, coloniality is different from colonialism. Colonialism denotes political and economic relation uh, in which the sovereignty of a nation or a people rests on the power of another nation, which makes such a nation an empire. However, coloni um, however, coloniality refers to long-standing patterns of power that have emerged as a result of colonialism. And we see this in our education system. These uh, patterns of power define our culture, our labor, as Alexis spoke about, intersubjectivity relations, and knowledge production, which is the epistemicides that Savo spoke about, um, as well as, uh, and these things go beyond the strict uh, limits of colonial administration. But significantly, he says that colonial coloniality survives colonialism. It's maintained alive in books, in the criteria for academic performance. Um, and we see that generally we, you know, determine how intelligent someone is by how well the speaker comes English. Um, um, in cultural patterns, in common sense, in the, in the self-image of peoples, in aspirations of self, um, and so many other aspects of the modern experience. Um, in a way, as modern subjects, we breathe coloniality all the time, every day. And I think that, you know, a lot of other writers like Ngugi have spoken about this, about you know, the African mindset being replaced by the psyche of the colonizer. And I'll maybe go into that later, but I think that, you know, where um, Black South African students and some, some academics as well, where they got to a point where they felt like breathing coloniality in every day was suffocating and they just couldn't take it anymore. So I think I'll stop there. Uh, I, I, I really appreciate that. And I love that you talk about uh, Professor Ngugi Watsiongo. Uh, hopefully, we'll, we'll get a lot more into uh, some of the issues that he's also raised. But I, I want to bring this back to you, uh, Professor Yusuf uh, Wagi. And, and from I want you to address this bit for us, because in the spirit of trying to set the ball rolling and understand our own conceptions and understanding of what decolonization is, especially for someone who is into uh, the area of philosophy of education and all of that, help us understand that among all institutions, I mean, we need to decolonize everything, but why is the area of education perhaps the most important institution that we need to focus on and we need to decolonize as quickly and as strongly as possible? Thank you very much, and thank you to AASU for the opportunity to share some of my thoughts with you. And also a special thanks to James for inviting me on behalf of the organization. Um, I am a proponent of um, decoloniality at the moment, decoloniality of education in particular, and more specifically higher education. The question is why? My contention is that if we are not going to tackle or consider decoloniality as a legitimate form of resistance, but specifically intellectual resistance, then we might not uh, cultivate moments of emancipation and empowerment. So I think the opportunity is right for Africans, in the diaspora as well, to cultivate a notion of intellectual decoloniality, which specifically resists forms of knowledges and understandings that seem to subjugate and even subvert legitimate forms of knowledge. And if we are not going to look at intellectual decoloniality 
we might not begin to address what education ought to be. But I want to take a step backward and start off by asking the philosophical question which already <clears throat> Stoics before Aristotle asked. So what do we mean by education? And it is in, in response to that particular question that philosophers like Aristotle, Plato, and all the post-Stoic scholars responded. So what I would like to do is to say, unless we have some understanding in, in a very simplistic form of what education means, we might not begin to decolonize it. Because the decolonization or decoloniality of education rather depends on what we mean by education. My understanding of education is in the, what I would call the neo-Aristotelian sense. It, it is a form of an encounter. And this notion of encounter resonates with the experiences of people, humans, on the African continent. So when tribes with the multiple traditions and ethno-cultural features interact with other tribes, when people with their particular understandings of the world engage with one another, they establish an encounter. And education is that encounter according to which humans engage among themselves and with all others. So the encounter is then in the neo-Aristotelian sense, a form of social practice. It is the meeting point where humans and all other beings engage. So if we want to talk about decoloniality of education, we have to resist that which prevents or subverts humans from engaging with one another in plausible ways. I would argue in cosmopolitan ways later on. So the very idea of education as an encounter, um, simplistically put, a meeting place where humans ought to engage simply means that no one can deny the other one from being excluded from that encounter. No one has the right to impose his unilateral opinions and views and perspectives on another. Those views and perspectives are deliberated on rather than imposed. Because imposition would also imply a form of neo-colonization. So what I am saying here, unless we say that education is more than just curriculum and attending formal institutions, but it is rather a tribal leader engaging with the environment and the context, that encounter, or it can be an autonomous individual engaging, engaging in an agricultural experience on the lands, that encounter, and what emanates from that encounter, that is what we ought to call or refer to as education. So if we want to ensure that educational encounters for that matter are framed within a intellectual space of resistance according to what I would call a framework of decoloniality. Then we have to do things to make sure that that encounter remains inclusive and not exclusive. And one of the things that we need to do to ensure that the encounter remains inclusive is to open the encounter to what I would call forms of human assertion um, that the 
individual speaks her mind, that the individual comes to speech instead of being invited to speak her mind. So what is wrong with the current form or trends of democracy? The current trends of democracy talk about people being invited to a discourse whereby they can engage. But when you are invited, it simply means that somebody else still has control over you. But when you enter the space, the democratized space, and you exert yourself and speak your mind to disrupt the order of things, that is when you become an equal individual who can shape the direction of things to come. And that's a different form of democratization than the one that we are politically aware of. We include people, we decide who should be there, and then we decide for one another. No, the individual says, I have a legitimate right to speak my mind and I alter the conversation or the encounter instead of being told to do so. I speak my mind is different from being told to speak your mind. Because that, when you do that, you exercise what is called your, your intellectual autonomy. Because your intellectual autonomy would then be commensurable with the idea of an intellectual resistance you offer. And in that process, you embark on a process of decoloniality and the decoloniality of education. So, two th so I've said three things. I've said the decoloniality of education is sacrosanct. And in, in the space where I work daily, I would argue for the decoloniality of the higher education discourses on the continent. And that implies that humans ought to engage not just democratically, but autonomously. Because when they engage autonomously, they begin to exercise their minds and speak their minds without having been invited to do so. So their whole presence causes a sense of disruption. Otherwise, you're not going to have decoloniality of education if there's not going to be a sense of disruption. A disruption, but what, what is often referred to as the rupturing of the moment. And then together with that, those two factors, that you have autonomy, you have a sense of a democratized space, there has to come what we call an activism which is responsible. So it's a form of intellectual activism whereby what you proffer should result in something that is empowering and emancipatory. So it is not entirely dissociated from the critical domains of higher education. It is linked, but it is more about asserting yourself, disrupting the moment so that you can become intellectually activist. And when you become intellectually activist, then you will begin to say, but it is not sufficient merely to rely on Euro Eurocentric forms of knowledge, but it is important that we begin to accentuate localized forms of knowledge, but bring it into conversation what already exists. And when you bring it into conversation what already exists, then you are not abandoning legitimate forms of knowledge, you are giving forms of knowledge a different dimension. So you can no longer talk about Eurocentric forms of knowledge if you bring it into conversation with localized or indigenous forms of knowledge, then you have to begin to talk about globalized forms of knowledge, which is completely different from the Eurocentric Anglo-Saxon forms of knowledges which have dominated our continent for so long. But what I'm saying, it's not a matter of just throwing out the baby with the bathwater. I adhere to the 
African philosophical positions of the quasi Meridus, Ndri Asil Mumbas were espoused for a fusion of knowledge idea, for a harmonization of knowledge idea, that the most empowering form of knowledge would be as a consequence of bringing disparate forms of knowledge into a form of an encounter. So that is how I understand the decoloniality of higher education, but it has to begin from the premise that education ought to be considered an encounter. And when that encounter is understood, then we know we have to democratize it autonomously. And once we democratize it autonomously, then the possibility is there to act as an intellectual activist. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Wahid. And uh, there are a couple of things that I've picked from this very interesting nuance that you have brought to this conversation. I'm going to come back to you uh, to try and get some more clarity and understanding on that. But, but I want to take this to um, Dr. Heleta then, uh, because it's, it's both a, I mean, a delight and, and a desperation or confusion uh, from what um, Professor Wahid says. Because while I appreciate that education is far more than what we generally think it is, that is walking into the classroom and learning what is on the board, um, it makes me also wonder that, that where exactly do we start from? Because it looks like this is an unwinnable battle. So to so talk to me about agency and, and whose duty it is to do what? Because very recently in Ghana, we're discussing the curricula, and we're talking and sharing our experiences from basic school when we we're learning about the benefits of colonialism. I mean, if, <laughs> if, if after all these years, it is still in our curriculum somehow, then where's the element of agency and who's responsible for what? Can you, can you speak to that element for us? Um, yeah, I can, I can try, but um, I just wanted to say, I, I really enjoyed, I mean, I enjoyed everybody's input, but uh, Prof, um, you, what you've said about the encounter and the agency and the need to democratize the, the classroom and the learning spaces, um, it's, it's so absolutely important. Uh, I mean, though it goes back to Freire and others who, who wrote about the need to to change the way we see education, that it's not about this one person standing at the top of the classroom and feeding this, these ideas and knowledge to, um, to students who are kind of like the, 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 the empty bottles that are just receiving this information. Um, it's, it's, it's absolutely crazy that, that there are a lot of spaces where this is still happening and where you have the one person feeding the knowledge to, the other, to all the other people. Um, how are we going to go about it? How are we going to change that? Um, this, is, this is where the problem comes. It's not easy to just say, look, do this or do that. Um, what, I, what I have to say is that it's, it's, it's great to see in a lot of spaces that this is a discussion. Um, I, I'm hoping that the, the young people who will replace the old academics will come with different ideas. And, and, and they, you know, um, one of the things, so, so when, I, when I work with young student activists in South Africa who, who were part of FISMAS4, um, after 2017, I said, look, guys, you need to write about what happened because if you don't, others will this, try to describe what was happening, what was going on, what, what were your aims and objectives and all that. And then we started writing together and then, you know, we, we still writing about things and trying to, you know, understand what was going on and also to kind of take it forward, the discussion and where things are going, what needs to happen and all that. Um, and, 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 you know, a lot of times the students would come and say, look, I mean, I don't know, we, 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 we don't see the hope here. We don't see the hope in the universities. You know, and I tell them, look, the only the only way things that are going to change uh, is 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 if you remain in academia, if you finish your honors, masters, PhDs, become an academic. Because, you know, one of the demands of the fees must fall movement was 
decolonize higher education and curriculum now. And, and the problem was that you cannot, the people who've been there who were deliberately maintaining the, the, the oppressive status quo in higher education were now being asked to decolonize higher education. And they're not gonna do it. They, it was never their interest. Um, ideologically is against their, you know, views and politics and worldviews and all that. So they're not gonna do it. And even if they do it, it's gonna be some completely incomplete, you know, superficial change. So if you want to see the change, you probably have to do all the hard work yourself and do it yourself. And so I don't see, I don't see easy changes and easy victories. Um, the only hope is that you guys go all the way and replace the people and the, 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 the models of education and the systems and the approaches to education. Um, and you, you make things better because you, you, you know how bad things are. That's the only way. That is honestly the only way. There's no other way. I but, think the but, young generations yeah. have, to, have, to, have to build better systems. But, but Dr. Heleta, let me just stay with you on, on this one. And, and for me, I think that's where the challenge is because as a young person myself and interacting on social media among peers and all of that, there's a sense that that awareness is, is lacking. And so we're all put in this bubble of modernization, neoliberalism, that everything revolves around capital. And we're all interested in money making, nothing about ideas, nothing about culture and all of that. And while I appreciate the point that you make, uh, that the older generation may be lost in this, but with the current generation also completely seemingly unaware of, of what is happening, where, where ought the direction really be? Because I see that in South Africa, because of the very tense and more recent history of friction along the lines of race, among other things like that, that level of consciousness is more visible in South Africa than you would find in Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Nigeria, because of our experiences. So it's a, it's a very desperate case. <laughs> what do we do among, our, among peers as young people? Yeah, look, um, I mean, thank you for all these questions. And, and, and these are such big questions. I mean, we need, we need to write books to actually try to answer your questions. And, and I mean, it's, it's, it's so important to ask these questions. <sighs> what do we do? Um, so Sakila and I are working, or we will be working on a paper um, for a book, a chapter for a book next year. Okay. What we're looking at, um, we're looking at Burner Boy's song, uh, Monsters You Made. And um, I'm, I'm hoping that all of you know, what's, you know what, what he sings about. He sings about Nigeria. He sings about the social, economic, political, and other challenges that ordinary Nigerians face on a daily basis especially the young people. But in the song, in, there, there, is a, there is a part of the songs when he speaks about or sings about education. He, he, he sings about, and I'm looking at the lyrics, you know, he, he sings about how Nigerians like himself would skip classes in school because the teachers were teaching white men's and Europeans teachings. And that contributes to the, to the understandings of the problems and ideas and how we see things. And so it's these, and, and, and one of the things that Saki and I, Sakila and I would like to look at is the, you know, if, if these problems are still felt in Nigeria today, even though the country has been independent for so long, um, if, if, you know, I mean, you said in Ghana, kids are looking at trying, you know, being asked to explain the benefits of colonialism. I mean, the craze, that's, that's, that's absolutely crazy. Um, what does it then say to what does the Ghanaian experience and Nigerian experience say to South Africans? Because, you know, will anything change in the next 30, 40 years in South Africa and in South African higher education? Because all these things that are happening in South African discussions, debates about decolonization 
were happening in Mozambique in the 60s and the 70s, in, in Nigeria, in Ghana. I mean, Ngugi was writing about it in the 80s, you know, about things that he was busy with in, in Kenya in the 60s and the 70s. So there are no easy ways. Um, I mean, student unions like, like yours have a ton of work to do. How do you mobilize? How do you organize? How do you get to engage more with South Africans who've been part and parcel of FISMA for calling for discussions, calling for debates? You know, ask them, how far did you get? They'll probably tell you we didn't get anywhere. Yes, we have discussions and debates about decolonization in South Africa, but can you actually show me what has improved? Not so much. And so you, you gotta keep pushing because, you know, I don't know if other than a few progressive, um, I mean, there are progressive spaces, definitely. That's what keeps us sane and going because otherwise, you know, you just lose it if there's nobody else to engage with. They, they are progressive academic spaces. But overall, you know, decolonization of curriculum and decolonization of knowledge have been kind of left behind. And now everybody is going to blame the pandemic. Oh, we can't do anything because there is a pandemic and we have to do other things. So it's, and and, and, and it, it's, I've seen it in my own progression, in my own research uh, with some of the former student um, activists, where we went from being optimistic that things can change to writing papers about how, you know, we don't know if anything is going to change. And, you know, may, there is a definitely need and, and it's something that hasn't been done enough. The intra-Africa in student engagement on what are they teaching us? Like when Bernard Boyd speaks about in his song, you know, the European and white men's teachings, you know, is that the case? And if so, what now? How do you challenge that? Hey, um, thank you. And I, I, would, I would go to, uh, I'll come to Alexis later for him to also usher us into, especially the Pan-Africanism dimension of this conversation. But because of what uh, Dr. Heleta said, I want to just quickly go to um, uh, Sakile for, for a bit of, and again, Sakile, I see that you do a lot of work on employability and, 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 and unemployment within the African space and all of that. So given that the way our education structure and system has, has been put up is to ultimately simply just train you to find a job somewhere. And that has occupied the minds of young Africans across the continent. That also coupled by the economic depravity and the difficulty means that financial independence is a must and it directs our aspirations, it directs our life and, and all of that. So in decolonizing education, what aspects of this economic angle, employment and all of those things, can we associate with? And, and what do you think, especially for young people, would be more relatable? I mean, Dr. Heleta talks about um, uh, Bernard Boy's uh, work and all of that. And a lot of us, I mean, jump on it, we dance to the Afro, uh, fusion, Afro tunes, and all, but that element of employability in a decolonized education framework within Africa, how does that look like? The microphone. Yeah. Thanks, Abdul. Um, yeah, again, big questions. Maybe if you don't mind, I'd like to just comment on your previous question to Dr. Heleta. And um, in terms of what you do, I think you challenge you challenge in the spaces that that you are in. So if you have, if you're in a in a lecture room and or a classroom and you have someone teaching you and saying, you know, let's recite or you know regurgitate the benefits of colonialism, you should challenge, obviously in a respectful manner and with some research, but you should challenge that that thinking, that understanding, um, and that's 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 part of the process. And I think that of what we do, um, having a voice is key. And I think that Prof. Yusuf spoke, spoke to that, um, that the autonomy that comes with that, but also 
um, creating spaces like this. And you're, you were speaking about how, you know, from engagement in social media, it seems like, you know, South Africa, there's a, there's a greater level of consciousness. Um, and per perhaps there is, but it's ironic because, you know, in my classes, we're, we're quoting Nkrumah when we're discussing neocolonialism, you know, so we're looking to Ghana and saying, you know, wow, this guy, you know, him, you know, he was, you know, him, Biko, they were that cohort of thinkers. So, but there's also, you need to challenge within your respective space. You need to create safe spaces. Um, and this is not necessarily just for people who believe what you believe, but also for people who can come into those spaces and learn a little bit more. And I think that, you know, what Prof, Prof Yusuf was saying is that, you know, people think that when we're talking about decolonizing curricula or higher education, we want to throw everything out, we want to throw all, our, all the knowledge out, and that's just not the case. And if some of those people can come into these spaces and maybe have a bit of a better understanding about what we're talking about, um, that would help. Um, yeah, so, but going back to, and I guess it's, it's part of the, the significance of decolonizing higher education is that, uh, uh, you know, education is supposed to be a tool and we've spoken about, you know, its potential for empowerment. And I think that, you know, you can't necessarily use the tool that was designed to oppress you, to liberate you. So, you, it's important to know what the limits of the education you're getting. And maybe before I come back to employability, I, I have a background. I did my honors in economics before I joined development studies. And, you know, even if you look at, for example, kind of neoliberal economics, which is what most of the world adheres to. Um, and it's, you know, my students have a nice contradiction because they have development studies on one hand and economics on the other as they majors. But if you look at um, what, what their advice is in terms of Africa's, Africa needing to grow their economies to create jobs, it's all kind of structural adjustment programs, you know, you know, reduce government spending, including on education and open up markets, liberalize the economy, you know, and we need to be in spaces where we say, okay, let's look at the history of structural adjustment programs. Have they actually yielded the results that they were purported to? And if they haven't, maybe we need to alter our thinking, you know, and rather than just taking these tenants as, you know, self-evident and true that, you know, uh, reducing government extended expenditure, liberalizing markets uh, will ima magically create a, a trickle down effect that will create jobs for our graduates because that's not happening, you know, and even, you know, with regard to employability, it's a, it's a tension of this kind of marketization, commodification of higher education, where now the onus of the onus is being shifted to universities to you know create these work ready graduates that can birth highly skilled graduates that can you know go into the market you know and supposed to be you know kind of this uh, what can I call it a uh, a self or a self uh, perpetuating and reinforcing cycle of universities producing high skilled graduates that you know add to the knowledge economy and they create more jobs but that's just not happening you know and part of the part of the process of decolonizing is trying to find tools or knowing the limits of the tools that we have to understand our realities and that's kind of one of the failings of the education system as we understand it we followed the models, we followed uh, the linear development path that you guys, that you know, the IMF and the World Bank said we should take, but we're not getting the results. So we need to not follow it blindly anymore and think about alternatives. I think that will stop there. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Pile, for, for, for that also. And like I mentioned earlier, there's an element of Pan-Africanism to this conversation that we are having. And that is to say that in terms of decolonizing education, an Africanism as a sociopolitical, economic tool or ideology could be useful to, I mean, help us understand and deconstruct issues of uh, coloniality among other things. So I would have um, Alexis speak to that for us. Alexis is also uh, a, a, a member of the United Pan-Africanist movement. And of course, as somebody who also who works within the education space understands this. But 
Let me just quickly acknowledge that I've seen uh, quite a number of messages uh, in the chat box. I'll be coming to them. Uh, for the rest of us who are, are also part of this conversation, I'll be very happy to, to hear from you. So do feel free to I mean, send in your comment, your question, if any. And as we try and wrap up later, I would have you uh, come in to engage our panelists. We promised a one hour conversation, already gone past the one hour. And so I would uh, beg your indulgence to still stay with us as we try and continue with this conversation. So, so, so Alexis, address that element for us on your own, I mean, survey and appreciation of the issues with the element of Pan-Africanism also in there. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Budu. And uh, just before I jump into that, uh, uh, the, this, uh, this is a very interesting uh, discussion. And uh, um, Professor uh, Wahid talked about, you know, the agency. And uh, we, we've seen uh, Dr. Savo Heleta talking about, uh, you know, the, the element in the song of Banaboy where, you know, students feel like this is not part of them. This is just European or the, you know, Western system of education. And uh, it doesn't touch on, you know, the issues which are affecting them. Um, and uh, and uh, another interesting, uh, you know, aspect which uh, Mr. Shakir has brought about, uh, you know, about, uh, about, you know, the kind of system of education that was brought to us, of course, 57 years ago. Yes, it's, um, it may not have, you know, met the, you know, the challenges or rather the aspirations that we may have had, but uh, should we dump this, you know, system of education? Should we just, I mean, something which brought us out of illiteracy, something which gave us, you know, leverage, and now at least we have some income. So I just want to basically, you know, take this to, you know, the other perspective and which is Pan-Africanism and why is it that, you know, we need, uh, will Pan-Africanism as the topic, uh, you know, of the day is talking, we need to solve the challenges that we have. So I want to begin this by saying that, uh, 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 the topic of discussion, of course, which is decolonization, uh, decolonizing education in Africa and why Pan-Africanism, you know, it, can it break the jinx? So I just want to kick this discussion with, you know, three quotes from three important or rather eminent persons uh, in Africa. The first one is Nelson Mandela. And uh, what does he define, you know, uh, what does he talk about education? He says that education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Then number two, talk about Professor Arthur Guseni Oliver Mutambara, of course, um, uh, he talks from Zimbabwe, he talks about education, that education must be a means to an end and not an end in itself. And then lastly, I want to talk about what Mr. Osman Tore says about this. Uh, of course, Osman is from the Gambia, he says, education is the only uh, way out of darkness. Education is the only way out of ignorance. And education is the only way to the glorious light. So I just want to agree with this uh, gentleman, 100%. But the question from my end, as I talk about Pan-Africanism, you know, is where did the rain start beating us, Africans, you know, as far as education in Africa is concerned? Is African development being derailed by not so good, you know, yet too much education? We, we learning so much, we pumping so much into our students, yet is not really uh, producing much rather than job seekers, you know, instead of, uh, you know, job creators. So uh, the answer is yes, of course, the system of education in Africa is not good enough uh, to take the continent into economic and uh, business prosperity. So once again, the question is, where did the rain begin beating us? And there is a link I shared uh, with you, Mr. Abdul. I don't know if you have it. There is a three-minute conversation. I just want us to look at the perspective of, you know, one of the uh, uh, scholars from Nigeria. What does he talk about uh, this? Where did, um, you know, is this system really working? And uh, what is it that we can do? Just if you can play for me, kindly. It's a three-minute video. Uh, you're, you're on mute. Uh, Abdul, you're on mute.
Yeah, okay. uh, I don't know. Um, I'm not able to hear the audio. I don't know. Maybe I'm the. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, it seems maybe there's a, there's a challenge of audio. Maybe I can summarize what he's trying to say. Can I summarize what he's trying to say? Hello, Mr. Abdul, can you hear me? Alexis, I can hear you. Do you want to come in now? Uh, I don't know. Uh, from my end, I'm not able to hear the audio of the video. I don't know. Uh, is it uh, is it just oh. me? Uh, then let me let me find out from others. I, I, I do not know if... Yeah, I think it's the okay. same challenge. So, so maybe you would have to just proceed then. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's okay. It's okay. So uh, before I proceed, so, so, let me just summarize. So, so Alexis, Alexis, what I would do is that I'll, I'll share the, the link of the video uh, in, yes. the, in the chat so that others can uh, see it. It's just a two minutes, 51 seconds, not too long. All right, so please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, it's just three minutes. So I just want to summarize what uh, uh, I'm yet to get his name, uh, but I like his discussion. What he's, saying, uh, what he's trying to say is that uh, um, they, when they brought this system of education, you know, uh, they took Africans from practice to theory, you know, to create a labor force for themselves. So they brought in a system of education, which produced, I mean, which promoted rem remembering instead of thinking for the sake of creating jobs. So they wanted to create good employees who do not think, but can remember. So they brought in a school system where you learned um, stuff like Homo habilis, who was Shaka's mother, what is the longest river in Africa? And, uh, you know, so you go to school, you learn how many times Muslims pray a day, you wake up at night uh, to memorize photosynthesis, to memorize how many teeth a dog has, you memorize everything. At the end of the day, you produce a graduate who is a container of useless knowledge. Uh, sorry, these are not my words, <laughs> I'm just quoting him. And uh, so he says uh, 57 years after independence, we have doctors who cannot make vaccines. Uh, we, so you walk out of medical school as somebody who knows when to give Panadol and how to take temperature. So you're a doctor who is a Panadol distributor. It's not your mistake, but the system of education that was brought in. So we have professors in the forestry industry who knows how to label, label the parts of a tree and note the value of a tree. So when the mission, their mission succeeded, they came to set up industries. And when they set up the industries, who was the laborers? It was the graduate from the School of Remembering. So someone who knows how to talk, uh, who knows how to tick, where to tick, someone who knows how, to, uh, someone who will remember how to cut a tree and how many pieces. The, and uh, they rewarded you with a bribe called a salary and we became comfortable. So when they came to, when they came to Africa, what do they come to do? They come to reap your resources and you are a means of production. So this is what made Africa poor. So I just wanted to bring out you know, that element from that and uh, uh, say that, uh, so this is as much as, uh, you know, um, as much as Mr. Shakir is saying, uh, we should not you know, um, really dump this system. Of course, it is brought us far, but the aspect that we're trying to see, why is it that 57 years you know, down the line, Africa is still poor? Kenya was the same level as Singapore. But why is it that we are still suffering? We have people who, you know, uh, I mean, we have roads which 
have a lot of congestion. We have, uh, you know, students who are still going to school barefoot, hungry. We have challenges of, you know, technology. Right now in Africa, we cannot communicate along the way issues of, you know, technology must fail. So with this, it's my strong belief that we, all, we are all in agreement that this system of education is not really working. The Western system of education introduced in Africa is not working and is not really the same as the one which is, you know, in the Western or European uh, countries. But away from this, there are severe challenges which are affecting us. And those challenges, of course, number one of them, if you look at this kind of statistics, like in Africa, 50% of children under the age of 14 are out of school and 60% of youths between the age of 15 and 17 are not in school. And what could be the reason? So these are some of the challenges which we did, uh, you know, need to look at. And of course, well. their solution uh, and the courses being direct costs, which include school fees, clothing, books, uniforms, etc. Of course, there is the issue, the element of health and nutrition, distance to school, infrastructure, outdated curriculum, which we are talking about now, uh, some of which which is substandard, and also the environments, you know, are of poor quality. We have bad national legal frameworks, we have untrained teachers, we have bad legal enforcement of education policies, so on and so forth. So in fact, some of the common skills which our people back then, you know, during the pre-colonial Africa had to learn included, you know, dancing, cooking, wine making, as much as this never solved the problems which we have, the common problems we have right now in Africa include famine, lack of drinking water, not just water, but clean water, Diseases outbreak, of course, we're talking of COVID, we're talking of malaria, Ebola. And we believe some of these could be scientifically engineered diseases, you, you never know. It's just a, it's just a, a, you know, a, a thinking, an assumption. So the solution to these problems is education that we train our people on agricultural ways and technologies, you know, create irrigation experts, medics, and we have, of course, large parcels of land, which are very idle which should be used by you know, agricultural and irrigation experts by applying modern technologies to solve hunger, but then instead of you know, waiting for rain for, for us to plant. So once again, uh, it's, we've come a long journey and it's a shame that you know, uh, our forefathers, of course, we're talking of uh, uh, Julius, Malim Julius Nyerere, we're talking of Kwame Nkrumah, we're talking of uh, you know, even um, the, the recent, uh, uh, Dr. John Pombe Magufuli, we're talking of uh, Gaddafi, these people, they had uh, a vision for Africa. But yeah. then somehow along the way, they, they, oh, and in these guys, they were Pan-Africanist. And along the way, this did not you know, work out. The thing is, if you try to bring you know, an African you know, out of, uh, you know, to bring him to his senses, then you will see, yes, we have resources and the resources are going. Then uh, you know, this does not really sound really so good. You know? To, to you know to the uh, colonizers and that's why we have neo-colonialism uh, like now in, uh, in Zambia I don't know whether it's Zambia or Zambia we have a chief who is a, a Chinese you know <laughs> we have of course MPs we are not saying that it's wrong to have an Indian who is uh, you know uh, you know uh, in uh, the provincial administration or administration of uh, you know um, public service but we are saying that uh, let's also try to see let's you know, go away from the courses. And I didn't say that sociology is a bad course. I didn't say philosophy is a bad course, but Fair I'm well. saying that there are courses which really need to solve the immediate problems, problems that we have in Africa. So let me stop here. I'll Fair continue well. next. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexis, for uh, some of the issues that you, you, you highlight. And I, I want us to stay on this element of Pan-Africanism. So I'll be coming to Professor uh, Yusuf Wahid now, but just to uh, say, like I promised earlier, with some of the comments that have come in. I would also put in some of these comments and any of you can uh, address them also if you find uh, the need to do so. Bismarck uh, says that, um, I believe that the success of decolonizing is strongly hinged on the Africanization of institutional culture uh, in, uh, in our schools. And he says that for me, this makes it a top echelon responsibility to government, African Union, ministers, vice chancellors, among others. He also asked that how are we able to eradicate the colonialist epistemologies and social practices in order to 
centralized um, Africa's own when we are not self-sufficient uh, as a continent. So, and then add um, briefly that as our um, speakers, our speakers sure that we will be successful at this endeavor. And he says that he wants to be optimistic, but he cannot because of some of the very obvious uh, uh, issues that he has raised. Rexford also talks about modernization. So let me just take Rexford's comment also very quickly, and then Prof can uh, come in uh, on some of the issues. So modernization theories argue that a modernization level once attained cannot be eliminated. Also following Marx's historical uh, materialism philosophy, I believe um, he says that there would uh, still be a significant remnant of modernization in our um, education sector. On the basis of these theories and philosophies, uh, Resworth says that he believes uh, that it is nearly impossible to decolonize education. That doesn't give us hope at all, uh, Professor Yusuf. And you may also want to add the element of Pan-Africanism because just like feminism, we have succeeded in making it a very scary ideology that a lot of young people today don't want to be part of. Because Pan-Africanism to them is to wear um, old clothes, walk barefoot, don't drive beautiful cars, and all of that. A lot of misconceptions, Prof. OK, thank you very much. Um, OK, let me say a word about Pan-Africanism quickly. <clears throat> My reading of Pan-Africanism is that the, the founders, the pioneers of that particular movement, they had in mind engaging others in conversation. So they didn't have in mind imposing their views unilaterally on others and then others would have been guided and steered like a chattel in a particular direction. They had in mind engaging people so that people could articulate their views so that people could speak their minds so that people could engage in critique and, and disagreement vehemently. So the Pan-African movement was a movement to engage African intellectualism in a conversation about the ex existentialism, about the reasons for being, uh, about why are we here? How can we contribute to the advancement of Africa? And more specifically, how can we enhance the knowledge traditions of the continent? And not just export it, as we have imported many strands of knowledge, but how we can engage with other traditions in order to enrich our own. So the Pan-Africanist movement, to my mind, had in mind a particular agenda of deliberative engagement. I talk to you, but you should have the courage to talk back and then we deliberate so that what ensues would be a combined effort of togetherness. So we are in this world in association rather than as an aggregation. So we are, we, this is the problem we have on the African continent. We, we have changed our institutions. I can talk about universities, but the universities have remained the same. The ethos have remained the same, but yet the demographics have changed. Why? Because the conceptions have remained static and the influences have been in assimilated instead of having enlightened people to change. So what I wanted to say about Pan-Africanism and, and why I think I am attracted to the movement is because of three things. Pan-Africanism is, is an intellectual position which and encourages humans to be open-minded. And to be open-minded really means to be open to what is new and what is surprising and what is strange. To be open-minded means that you should not just listen to things which you will be happy with, but that you should also listen to things 
which will cause you much discomfort. I'm open-minded to things that will rattle me and that will disrupt my thoughts. I'm open-minded because I'm receptive to, to novelty, to new things that might happen. And in that way, I'm open to new, new beginnings. So the, the very idea of open-mindedness is conceptually linked to this practice of what we call a pedagogy of courage. It's, and, and to have a pedagogy of courage implies that you need to be open to the world because you insert yourself into the world and then you try to change it. So for me, Pan-Africanism speaks to that idea of being open-minded. So as students, as intellectuals, if, if you are not open-minded to thought and, and you cannot be receptive to what is new and what is different, then you, then you will remain in a quagmire of ignorance. And this is our problem. Our problem is, it, is because we are not open-minded to what is new and surprising, we, we have, in a way, stultified our knowledge. We have remained there. And that is Africa's major problem, the stultification of knowledge because of our lack of capacity to be open-minded. So you would notice that, that, that now I will steer clear of political examples, because in many cases, political examples and political figures have succumbed to the social malaise of corruption when profit and money have bought them over. They have succumbed to the very capitalist ideals that, that they resisted at first. So let me not invoke political figures here. And let me not also generalize. So, but I want to stay away from political examples because the political examples of the day are not worthwhile referring to. So if you develop this kind of pedagogy of courage, and if you're open-minded, the possibility is always there invariably that you will contribute to the decoloniality of education. And, and that is an intellectually activist way of changing it through open-mindedness. The second element that the Pan-Africanist movement has certainly made me aware of is the idea of having the courage to take risks. You knew that if you're going to be oppositional, you might suffer torture, you might suffer humiliation, and you might even suffer death. But you nevertheless had the courage to take the risk. And this is what we can learn from our past. If we have the courage to take risks, then there's always the possibility that things anew might happen. And, and this idea of, of, of taking risks is an act of being courageous because you don't know, you don't foresee what is going to happen. So the Pan-African idea for me is an idea which should instill in one the capacity to take risks. And, and the last aspect with, with what I can learn from the Pan-Africanist idea or the movement itself the, the ethos is never to treat anything as a finished product. So transformation is always in the making. Um, decoloniality doesn't have an end result. It's, it's always in the making. If you think you have embarked on the decoloniality of education and you've reached a particular point, a particular end result, that end result should be treated as a new beginning or something new. So what I imagine Pan-Africanism has in mind is that we consider what happens 
through the changes that unfold, and maybe this is where courage comes in, that you don't become too negative and pessimistic about your, your own efforts to intellectualize change, uh, but that there's always an opportunity, an opportunity that things will be different. 25 years ago, when I joined, uh, speaking anecdotally, when I joined a university that was renowned for producing the apartheid politicians, I, at the 25 years ago, the, there was hardly any change at the institution. But one had to be courageous because you had to imagine education should be a something should be something in the making there should always be an opportunity for a new re-beginning if you want to look at the institution now you might argue well but change has been minimal nevertheless there has been change where the minimal it, there has been it might have not now might not have been as substantive as it could have been but at least there is a moment now for a new re-beginning, for another opportunity. So this is what I think the revolutionary thinkers have in mind when they say that treat any situation, and this is what, what the Pan-Africanist thinkers had in mind, treat any situation as a new re-beginning, as rather look at the, the opportunity for the revolution than wanting to have the revolution all the time. So look at the revolutionary spirit and look at the opportunities for change and how things have changed. So you're asking me maybe now, how do you get it right? I think there was always this possibility. So over 25 years, I would imagine I have produced about 40 PhDs. And when I encountered my PhD candidates, and I never treated them like students because they were my equals, I said, what is your intellectual voice? How are you open to what I have to say? And how am I open to what you have to say? Because it's your project. And because it's your project, take the risk to put on paper what you think. And then they would ask me the question, but my, my dissertation is my product. I said, yes, it is your product, but it remains a product in the making. Even after you have submitted your dissertation for examination, it's never a completed project. Some of you, even I, whoever, we still talk about our roots in our PhD and we continue in that tradition or we move away from that tradition. So I think intellectual activism in a very simplistic way can happen. There is that possibility. And I'm an optimist to say, if there's open-mindedness like the Pan-Africanist thinkers had in mind, if people are prepared to take risks and if you consider things uh, as unfinished, in the making, in becoming, then decoloniality of education will always happen. So that is what I mean when I say we have to democratize the higher education spaces because it's a different kind of democracy that relies on individual autonomy and not major majoritarian rule. Individual autonomy will shift the intellectualism of people and the ideas in that community, rather than having to tag along with a community with a vote, and you don't even know in which direction you are going. So for intellectual activism is different from political activism. But I'm not intimating that we should not have political activism. But I think first, intellectual activism that can then stimulate you more to become a Nelson Mandela or a Paolo Freire in that respect. Political oh. activists. Oh, this is incredible.
uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I see uh, Naomi Sewellas comment, great discussions from my leaders. Uh, Alexis uh, says that remarkable achievement, uh, Prof. And uh, at this point, uh, we've gone far beyond time as we had indicated earlier. And I apologize for that. And thank you also for, for staying with us. So what I will do now is that as we try and wrap up, uh, I want to come to you, Sakile and uh, Dr. Heleta. I have no questions for you. Ask a bit about reflections and attempt to try and um, round up on this conversation. I'll give you the opportunity to also, I mean, address any more issues that you find pertinent that we may have also missed. And then, so Sakile first, and then I come to Dr. Heleta, uh, and then I'll, I'll get Alexis to also come in. But what we can do, however, even as we try and wrap up, having taken a lot of your time, is that if you have a question and you want to ask it orally or contribute orally, uh, we can take a few, about one, two, three, uh, briefly. So you can prepare when um, um, Sakile, um, Dr. Heleta, uh, um, and then uh, Alexis are done with this round, you can come in and then we, we say goodbye. So, so Sakile, please go ahead, sir. Um, thanks, Abdul. Uh, I think in closing, maybe I can respond to um, a few things mentioned by uh, Prof. Wahid and also by... Uh, Mr. Alexis, and just, I mean, a lot of what they were saying resonated with me and I'm like nodding my head frantically. Um, maybe I'll start with uh, what Prof said about uh, pedagogy of courage. Um, and, you know, in relating to, I consider myself a teacher, teaching and learning and learning and teaching, it's a, it's a two-way process. And I think um, Alexis spoke about um, in the in the clip he, he he wanted to play, he spoke about creating students who are good and memorizing useless information. But that model, which Ferrer speaks about, or, or critiques, also um, encompasses, or it also puts the teacher or the lecturer as this all powerful, all knowing person who has all this knowledge which they're going to pour into the students, and that's just not the case. Um, so you know, kind of linking it back to what Prof was saying about a pedagogy of courage. It's also the courage for us to know that we don't know everything, you know, and, you know, the, the, the courage to, or maybe I think Prof used the term, the openness to have this idea of a co-contribution of knowledge. Like we come together to create new knowledge or to create new understandings of knowledge. And what I mean by this is that if I'm speaking to my students about poverty, and we're talking about, oh, this person is on a uh, dollar a day or whatever the figure is. My students already can explain to me that while they may be merit in measuring poverty this way, it's completely removed from the social realities and the experience of poverty that people experience. So it's a superficial metric for measuring the actual realities of poverty and, and what it's like. And you need this openness and this openness that it doesn't just enrich the students, it enriches your life as well as, as, as the lecturer. Um, in terms of uh, Pan-Africanism and, and, and our approach to that, I think that what Sabo and I have tried to do is kind of reflect a lot on a lot of the historical colonial constructs that prevent you know, greater engagement with our brothers and sisters across the continent. I mean, this may be in terms of why, you know, if we look at publications, I think Sabo will speak about this and has graphics he can show, you know, uh, African publishers uh, generally publish more with partners in the global, in the West or the global North than they do with their fellow Africans, even on topics about African economics or whatever. Um, so we can, we, we have to reflect on, on why those things are. And even, I think um, Alexis spoke about um, the traffic in Kenya and, and, and you know, infrastructure. And, 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 you know, one of the things that we really reflect on is this idea that, you know, colonialism brought, brought uh, roads and rail. But, you know, if we look at that road and rail, it was all about extraction. You know, I can't, I can't take a train from South Africa to Botswana. 
you know, or what any of the neighboring countries, you know, it, it, it's really about extraction of resources. And we need to, from an economic perspective, we need to maybe think about how those patterns of infrastructure development have been maintained and how they're perpetuated. You know, we need to sort of reflect and question, are we not just doing the same thing? Um, you know, and, and, and yeah, I think that even in terms of Pan-Africanism, we need to think, Sabo and I do a lot of work about borders and the, the construction and the arbitrary nature of which borders were constructed and how that has created our thinking and how that has created this idea between us and them. And yet when you really meet the them, you realize there's so many commonalities in our, in our culture and our experience, and that's not a coincidence. And, we, and, and, and maybe they need to be a re-remembering um, of what life was like before those borders. Um, so yeah, I think uh, maybe let me leave it there and then Sabo will pick up yeah. that I haven't covered. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, because I mean, when you reflect on some of these things, notice how perhaps Africa is one country because this connection of rail to extraction points and all of that. And I'm just reflecting in Ghana and I'm looking at Obwasi, I'm looking at Christia, where the gold, where the diamond and all of those things are coming from. And that's precisely what you are describing. So if you did not talk about Zambia or South Africa, uh, one could easily slot Ghana in there and think you're talking about the same country. But thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Aleta, you, you, you have the floor now, sir. Thank you. Um, I want to reflect on, oh, actually, I want to address one of the questions. There's a question in the Q&A. Um, it was posted a long time ago, and it's asking about the inadequate, inadequate financing of education on the African continent. Um, so, so I'm working on, in, I'm working in partly in international education. So, you know, we're looking at collaborations and partnerships and all the different things that are happening. And this is one of one of the major problems. Uh, one of the major problems on the African continent is that the African institutions and academics are always, oh, over the decades, have been looking towards the global north for. Um, it's part of coloniality that Sakila was talking about. You know, it's it's about you know the kind of the centers of power, the centers of no, of the centers of knowledge, uh, those Eurocentric centers of knowledge. Um, very often, African universities will have the strongest links with the institutions in the former colonial power. And 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 you know, again, this is by design. This is not just a a random, you know, situation. It's it's very much by design. But you know, when we talk about the complexities of of um, in higher education on the African continent, you know, we 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 talk about the colonial creation of higher education. Uh, we then talk about the post-colonial expansion of higher education um, in that you know nationalist uh, kind of period where new universities were created and then. After that, in many countries on the continent uh, came the neglect of higher education, came the, um, you know, very, you, you had, you know, from kind of political um, rule to military rule in many countries and the subjugation of academics. Many people have, you know, left the continent during this time. Um, then you get the new liberal structural adjustment programs, which for many decades literally decimated higher education and higher education capacity on the African continent. Most countries on the continent were told by the IMF and the World Bank that higher education is actually a luxury for you. So instead of investing in higher education, you need to invest in basic education. And if you want to develop graduates on the higher educational level, you should, you know, we'll give you some money for scholarships and you, could, you should send some of your young people to, um, Western world, and they can they can come back then and become government officials and all that. What they did was you you sending young people from the African continent to be fed again the Eurocentric and Western education to come back and to continue imposing the the same ideas from the IMF and the World Bank and all all the different institutions. Um, and and we get to a moment now over the past few decades where um, there's been 
underfunding of higher education in Africa. Uh, for example, South Africa spends about 0.8% of the GDP on research, development, and higher education. Countries like Uganda spend 0.18%, so about six times less than South Africa. So you have a situation where a university such as Makerere University um, doesn't, have, doesn't get money from the government for, um, for research. Where do they get the money from? They get the money from um, European countries, from United States, and from China. And so those countries, the funders, influence the research agendas of Makerere University. And also what it does is, you know, Makerere academics are then collaborating with the institutions from the funder countries, which is, you know, European institutions, American institutions, Canadian um, and Chinese institutions. And for that reason, and you can see similar patterns all across the African continent. For that reason, uh, there's hardly any new knowledge of the past decade and a half uh, that's been produced by, and uh, I mean, Sakila and I were preparing some graphics to show, but you know, the, the, the nature of our engagement is different, but that's absolutely fine. But you know, if you look at um, the knowledge produced on the African continent since 2005, um, there's hardly any intra-Africa collaboration that leads to new to, to research to papers and publications very minimal compared to the international collaboration so you know when we talk about pan-africanism unless there is collaboration intra-africa collaboration in higher education to create to produce new knowledge between you know people in ghana and south africa and you know nigeria and egypt and you know botswana and all across if that is not happening um i mean what are we talking about? It's it's just not going to happen. So, um, and and you know, I would recommend to everybody, and I'll write, I'll provide the link in the in the chat uh, section. Uh, in 2016, um, African Union came up with a new strategy for um, improving education on the continent, and there are some very interesting ideas, you know, for basic, secondary, and higher education. And African Union has been trying to get countries um, on the continent. Countries have committed to, to try and provide, you know, to spend 1% of their GDP on research um, and research development and higher education, but no country has done it since. And so I think, you know, to address that question again, funding is a huge problem. And unless, you know, there's, there's all that, there's, that, there's this, that saying about, you know, African solutions for African problems. Um, you know, we, we can't expect uh, genuine African solutions for African problems if they're funded by the Chinese funding, funding, American funding, European funding, all that funding comes with specific demands and there are all kinds of issues with it. Same with foreign aid. And so that is gonna be a problem until, you know, African countries invest more in research development and higher education. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Heleta, collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. And that's a very important point that you also uh, uh, make there. Um, Alexis, I'll, I'll give you the final word on this. Uh, if you can do that for us very briefly uh, so that we will try and wrap up. Uh, I've apologized enough to everybody for taking so much of your time. So Alexis, you have the final word and, and then we'll close. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, you, you, you've, uh, <laughs> you know, as the discussion keeps on moving, uh, you know, forward, you know, so many issues, you know, keep uh, coming up. But uh, I won't go into, into that, but I just want to talk about uh, what, you know, of course, uh, uh, Professor Wahid talked about, you know, how Pan-Africanism having, you know, ethos and, you know, self-identity and values. And, and uh, Dr. Savo has, you know, talked about collaboration. But now the aspect which comes here, you know, the, the aspect of, uh, uh, the, the aspect of, uh, you know, borrowing, you know, we've, in Africa, we've borrowed so much and, uh, it's really affecting us. And uh, for lack of a better word, I can say that our governments, you know, have somehow become, you know, slaves have become puppets of, you know, <laughs> uh, our colonizers. And that's why we are having 
neo colonialism coming back but having said that i just want to say that uh, what needs to be done you know what is in the mind of an african what is in the mind of an african uh, an african uh, as we speak now again i want to repeat this 57 years you know uh, since independence an african you know believes that africa is not the home you know he believes that he must go to australia must go to canada must go to the us he must go to the uk to go and learn there but then and again they understand that you need to leave africa you know for you to succeed but then how do we need to solve this for us we need to understand that we need to develop our culture we need to develop our education we need to develop our you know i mean we need to come to the reality you know of ourselves of our countries you know uh, and because of our graduates going outside and this is how we lose you know our labor force um but i i just want to say that uh, we need to look at our curriculum especially uh, like, like i said before it's not about you know specializing or being fluent in languages like english french you know portuguese german but we need to put our emphasis on the skills that we learn the knowledge that is ultimate goal will be to solve the problems that africa is facing again when we talk of hunger of course we need you know to know how to do away i mean how to you know study irrigation farming etc when we talk about water and sanitation we need to you know produce uh, we need to probably you know bring in infrastructure technologies which can produce solar water pumps so that we can be able to tap this you know natural resource that we have of course we have vast land and that's why now somebody wonders why you know we have countries you know people dying of hunger animals dying of hunger uh, famine uh, and uh, and yet uh, you know we have all this vast land if you look at egypt you know some countries have done well have been to israel if you look at what israel has done you know it's such a tiny country if you walk from <laughs> the north to south of israel you take seven hours just on the road and you're you, you finish you know walking from that country it's a very tiny country but in terms of technology in terms of education in fact their system of education and also their health system it's purely uh, there is no segregation the child of the prime minister goes to the same school as the child of amatatu taut i can say so they everything is equal the same hospitals there is nothing like a private hospital or a public school everything is the same but what have they done to be able to sustain that 50 percent taxation of course and again their salaries are very high probably the minimum person is earning uh, you know 15000 uh, 15000 uh, 1500 you know us dollars the minimum person but again 50 percent of that but you see here you may earn a lot but everything goes to school fees everything goes to medicare and all that so therefore we need to have ways through which we can have probably universal health care and, and so on and so forth so the schools must be solution centers they must be tailored in a manner that when you leave school the society your community is waiting for you so that um you don't become a job seeker but a job creator you know of course um we, we've talked of you know um putting so much emphasis on uh, elementary training you know basic training um uh, as as much you know instead of you know tertiary and so on and so forth but you see we are cramming we are remembering we are memorizing everything right from preschool or through to university you know so that for you to get a better grade you need to memorize and you know put it down you know copy paste that into a paper so therefore we need you know new learning and we need to see solutions to society we need to be patriotic and of course learn history behind this and uh, you know the civilization uh, you know behind african people but just to wind on this some countries like japan what is it that japan did actually japan in uh, japan equally like other countries was zero but they sent their kids outside to learn and they kept track of them and when they finished learning they ensured they came back and they replicated what they learned so they sent their children out but kept track of them and instilled principles into them and the knowledge about themselves their own identity so then they went back to japan 
And after that, everything was boom. The same to China, the same to Singapore. But if you look at our countries in Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, Congo, so we need to learn about the resources which we have and how we can use them to solve the problems which are affecting us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to you, Mr. Alexis uh, Mayaka Bosire. And uh, thank you very much to all of you gentlemen. Just by way of closing, uh, I want to say again, uh, big appreciation to all of you. And quite clearly uh, from this conversation, it is, it is obvious that we, our, our education system here on the continent is plagued with coloniality. And beyond just the discourse on colonization or decolonization, the element of coloniality and decoloniality, if I could put that uh, uh, also, is, is very important. And today, uh, for many who are not into that space, who have learned very new things, and particularly also on the element of collaboration and the democratization of the space. It is something that I appreciate because of especially the analysis that uh, Prof gives there because oftentimes when we talk about subjects like this it seems to suggest or come across to many that it is a complete um, removal of everything an african and the replacement of that with everything african and that would also mean that we'll be boxing ourselves into this parallel of of education of knowledge among many other things so quite clearly on all the issues of dialectics, issues of interaction, issues of engagement that is raised here and all of that. I mean, I completely appreciate that. And I hope that the many others who have also joined us today would appreciate that. And just finally, that bits on identifying ourselves, recognizing our role and deciding, especially those who are in the process of knowledge production, that point made by Prof and reinforced by every other person is very critical because oftentimes after everything, we must ask ourselves really that what is our own contribution? And that's why I'm excited about this because my own um, um, MPhil dissertation uh, from uh, the African, uh, Institute of African Studies here at the University of Ghana uh, pretty much looks at some of these issues there because I've always wondered that despite the excellence by local football coaches here in Ghana, particularly in respect of the Black Stars. And I say Black Stars very cautiously because there are South Africans here today and they may not take lightly given recent events in respect of how our World Cup qualifying game went and all of that. But the point is that I'm interested in, in understanding that the local coaches or Ghanaians have done overwhelmingly well in terms of all the successes that we have achieved over the years. But there still appears to be this significant desire to employ and bring on foreign coaches. So why is that the case? And in the, even though I'm not done with this work, I see elements of um, colonial thinking and the need for decolonization among other things like that in there. So yes, it's education, it's sports, it's politics, it's economics, it's everything. But the knowledge production, the deconstruction, all begins and perhaps ends from where we learn what we know. And that's why this conversation has been very important. It's been an eye opener. It's been more enlightening. And I'm very grateful to all of you. Uh, thank you once again to you, Professor Yusuf Wahid. Uh, professor Yusuf Wahid is a distinguished professor, of philosophy of education, and uh, a lecturer at uh, the University, uh, Stellenbosch University uh, in, in South Africa. Thank you once again, Prof, uh, for your time. And also a big thank you to Dr. Savo Heleta. He is also a researcher and lecturer uh, in this area of higher education, internationalization of education, among many other things like that. Thank you so much, sir, for the very insightful contribution that you brought to this uh, engagement. And thank you also to Mr. Sakile Firi. Uh, he is also a lecturer and program leader of the undergraduate degree program at the University of Development Studies the, uh, Department at the University of Nelson Mandela uh, in South Africa. Thank you also, sir, for uh, your time today. Mr. Alexis Mayaka Busire is, a, uh, is with the uh, United Pan-Africanist Movement and also Secretary for Education and Disability 
uh, and uh, we're grateful to you, sir, for your time. And to all of you who joined us for this conversation, like I said earlier, we went far beyond the time that we promised we we're going to do. But of course, the conversation has been very interesting. So we're grateful to all of you and to the All Africa Students Union, uh, the working group on Africanism and African culture, led by uh, my colleague, uh, James Koji, uh, for the amazing work that he has also done. And to everybody here at the All Africa Students Union, we say thank you very much and we appreciate your time. And so maybe we can unmute and say bye bye to all to one another and then call it a day. Thank you once again. Thank you very much for hosting us. It was really yes, wonderful. All right, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank, thank you, you Abdul. And um, thank you to James as well. Thank you to A ASU as well. Thank you very much. Very well. And James is here. I'll have James just come in and say, and say <laughs> bring bye him bye out. Everyone. <laughs> everyone <laughs> <wants everything. laughs> All right, so thank you. Yeah. We'll talk some other time. All right, bye. Bye bye. Thank you.